I hold in my hand a bottle of Samuel Adams beer. I'm probably the only priest in all of the world that's doing that this morning, but I do so for three very intentional reasons. And the first is that this is the second Sunday of Lent, and if you have given up beer, or soda, or chocolate, or green beans for that matter, you are now called to break the fast. And to have that beer, or that soda, or that Hershey bar, or that green bean casserole, if you would like. Today is a feast day. And in the Western Catholic tradition, it's actually inappropriate to fast on a Sunday. So, sip, munch, eat. The second reason I hold up this particular beer is because that's brewed out of a particular brewery in Boston. It seems very fitting for us to celebrate the fact that this is the 267th anniversary this very month of Samuel Adams taking over the family business of preparing malt for brewing beer. Seems like someone needed to remember that today, and so it fell upon us to do it. Of course, he also, besides being someone who contributed to the brewing of beer, was a fairly major person in the formation of our country. And the third reason that I hold this beer, and now pass it to a minor, but we can do that in a church, <laughs> is that through this terribly torturous rhetorical approach over this last minute that I've had with you, I am giving, given the perfect excuse to mention, incidentally of course, that I happen to be the great, great, great grandson of Samuel Adams on my mother's side. So today I can look at you and I can claim that all things being equal, I by God am somebody. <laughs> of course, I can contend that I am somebody, notwithstanding the fact that I am Samuel Adams' great, great, great grandson. I'm somebody and you are somebody as well because God has claimed all of us as God's children based purely on God's grace and God's faithfulness and not notoriety gained by being somebody's kin. In our reading this morning from the letter to the Romans, St. Paul talks about the promise that God made to Abraham. Somehow in a way that the world could not comprehend, God would make 90 plus year old Abraham the father of many nations. Now, if you are that age, there's little chance that you're going to be the father of one, much less a nation. And so the plan, as the world would understand it, was simply dead in the water. But if this holy absurdity, this promise, is embraced by the heart and the body and the mind of an individual, and then is seen and simply lived as the truth, then presto, you do become the father of many nations. Gifts are given out by the grace of God, and one can either live into that gift or not. And Abraham chose to live into the gift that he was given. To put this another way, we all agree that water is out there for our taking. We just need to drink it in order to have life. Similarly, for Abraham to have holy life as it was being offered him, he just had to say, as did Mary, for that matter, okay, I choose to enter into the reality of God's world, absurd as it might be, and embrace life that admittedly we can only imperfectly understand and appreciate. And so the gift of his being the father of nations was given to Abraham simply out of the pure grace of God. God had faith that Abraham would take this on and Abraham was then faithful to the dream of God's, and as such, the hoops of the world's wisdom and understanding were tossed to the side. And instead of righteousness being gained through following the law, righteousness was just simply enjoyed by giving in to the humor of God, or God's turning the world on its head. In Paul's way of thinking, the story of Abraham and Sarah having a child really overturned the singular efficacy of the law. In the case of Abraham, he simply believed and entered into a trusting relationship with God, 
which was counted good as gold. Well, this can all be pretty difficult to understand, can't it? In particular, it becomes very hard to comprehend since many, if not most of us, certainly including me, are wired to think that believing is a way of earning God's grace, not unlike following the law gains you favor from God. Unfortunately, if we begin to believe that believing becomes a precondition for God's grace, then we have completely missed the boat. Instead, believing actually is only about entering into the reality that is already there for you right now. Now, let me suggest the following to illustrate the point. Returning to that little fun I've been having with Samuel Adams, I am not a relative of his because I've believed sufficiently that I am one. If that were the case, I would have chosen a different family, I think. <laughs> Instead, a few months ago, I found this sheet of paper in all of my mom's belongings that shows the genealogy. There I am, by gum, his great-great-great-grandson. I've now only entered into an awareness of that family tree, just as all, all can enter into the same celebrating that we are the sons and the daughters of God. It's that simple. So how does all this fit into the church and who we happen to be? Well, my hero, Robert Ferrer Capon, wrote in the preface of his book, The Romancing of the Word, which was a collection of three books that had previously been published, something that I find absolutely compelling. He says this, Nobody isn't, I-S-N-T, saved. Nobody isn't saved. Jesus takes away the sins of the world, not just the cooperative people. The church ceases to be an agency selling spiritual snake oil and becomes instead a party cruising the streets of the world trying to wake up all the deadheads and wallflowers to the fact that they're already at the bash. It invites not the world's cooperation, but its faith. And therefore, it's good news as nothing else in the world can ever be. The church is not Catholic or universal because it has everybody inside itself. It's never had them and it never will have them. The church is Catholic because it is the sacrament of a Catholic or universal Jesus, of a Redeemer who already has everybody, everybody inside himself and who asks us now to only trust him. As we've talked about before, Lent is a time of repentance. Repentance is not following some steps to get into God's grace. Instead, as Paul reminds us this morning, repentance is just embracing the good news that we are the apple of God's eye, we are the kin of Jesus, and we are hopefully not just awake to that, but now empowered to go out into the world and to make a fantastic difference. So today, this Sunday, break the fast and have that green bean casserole with the mushroom soup and the crunched up potato chips on top of it that you have just been dying for all week long. Toast Samuel Adams on the anniversary of his lesser known career. And most importantly, rejoice that you belong not just to a family tree, but celebrate even more so that you are attached to the vine of Christ. Amen.